Hey there gang, what's going on? We are in a very small town called Lowell, Wisconsin. It's central Wisconsin, just a little bit east of Columbus, where a crime happened back in 1980, where a beautiful young woman was killed and we're here to visit her grave and tell her story. And we are at the cemetery here in Lowell. And we are in. It was a cool night in March. It was March 10th of 1980. When a man named Lane McIntyre came home from work from nearby paper mill that he was working at. And as he came to the front door of his home, He noticed that the dog was still on the chain, late, barking. Lane was married to Marilyn. They're both very young in their 20s. They had a three-month-old boy, Christopher, and they were doing great until that night when Lane came home. And as he walked in the front door, the first thing that he saw horrified him. It was Marilyn, and she was laying sprawled out on her back right there on the living room floor of their small house. And she had a steak knife sticking out of her chest. As it turned out, she was not only stabbed to death, but she had been strangled and she had been pummeled and beaten and a man had also had his way with her. The first thing Lane did once he figured out that his wife was dead as he went to the bedroom to check on little Christopher to make sure that he was okay. And he was, thank God. He called his parents up to have them call the police and the police came And it was it's sad to say that they suspected that Lane was responsible for the murder. And the whole town suspected him for many years because the case went cold. Well, what turned out what turned out is there were there were many suspects. But what had happened was one of their friends, a man named Curtis Forbes, had been out. He he had a girlfriend and she did not want to have sex with him. They were at her parents' house. And he had to have sex, so he went to a friend's house, which would have been another victim. And 
luckily she was with a friend and they were drinking and he kind of came in and it was kind of weird. It was kind of awkward, they say. And he just said, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm out of here, you know, get some beer or something. He just disappeared. So it's lucky someone was there. His next stop was his other friend's house, Marilyn and Lane. And God only knows what happened in there that led to this horrible act. But as it turned out, he was the one who did it. What broke the case wide open was just by happenstance. It was Marilyn's niece, and of course the family, the family kept bothering and pestering the Columbus Police Department. And the, the case was fairly forgotten. So the family would check in, check in, and it was a mistake call that she made to the county sheriff. She thought she was calling the police department. And they took a whole different interest. They were like, let's reopen this case. What is the Columbus Police Department doing? Nothing. Let's, we'll do it. So they stepped in and they reopened that case to take a fresh look. And especially with new science, all the new sciences in forensic techniques. So very interesting. The phone, by the way, was answered by Detective Sergeant Daniel Garrigan, and you have to take your hats off. And I gotta tell you that people there are people in law enforcement that are just nine to five and could really care less. And then there are people that take their job passionately and get personally involved. And a lot of times that's what it takes to solve these cases. And there are a lot of those people, thank God. So they reopened the case and they had some new ideas. They had some new ideas that were really well, the latest stuff that you do, DNA is the biggest thing. They decided that they were going to exhume Marilyn's body here from the cemetery and see if they could pick up any DNA, any tissues. And what they look for now mainly is soft tissue under fingernails. Now, all the while, they had their eye on Curtis Forbes. He was, he was kind of the guy that they were zeroing in on. Not enough evidence, though. So what they did is they came here to this cemetery and they exhumed Marilyn and they brought her to the morgue and they opened the casket and unfortunately the casket is completely flooded with water and they did not have high expectations but as it turned out when they inspected her corpse or what was left of it they saw that she was wearing fake fingernails and the good news was, the good news was that they, well, they thought they could get DNA because what's common is you will, uh, a person will scratch the, the attacker and there will be residual, residual skin left under the fingernails. However, there was nothing, nothing usable, sadly. 
But they were smart. What they did is they, they did not release the news. Actually, they played it like they did have it. And then they kept their eye on Curtis. And what did Curtis do? He fled town. He freaked out. He tried to fake his own death. And they were like, they were on to him now. So what they did now was they pressured the old witnesses. And there were three witnesses who said that they remember that Big Mouth Curtis had at one point or another said that he had killed someone. But the big breaker, the big breaker was the woman, his girlfriend, who turned out to be later his wife, of course, testified that that night he did come home. And again, she was at her, I believe her parents' house, and he came barging in late. And he had a blue sweater on and a white shirt. And the white shirt, he needed to get washed. And I think it was her mother he asked to wash it. And she remembers there was blood all over that shirt. So they charged Curtis. It was iffy if this case would hold up. But they, they went to trial. And in November of 2010, like 20 years later, finally justice was served and he was found guilty. That's right. And what a look on his face. He was found guilty. And he got the usual sentence, not death. Let me tell you, in the old days, before 1950, 40s, in those days, everybody got death. Everybody, practically. If you murdered somebody. So it was really interesting that he just kind of panicked. And I, th I think, you know, looking back on it, the police really made, just re really made a great tactical move. This is Marilyn's grave right up here. Some beautiful flowers here. Let's take a look at the gravestone. Some beautiful yellow flowers here. She is not forgotten. 1980, March 10th. I don't know if these are stones of her parents or or what. I think this might be. This is where she's from. That's why she's here. I believe this is where Marilyn was raised. So we hope that Marilyn is resting in peace and Gosh, feel really bad for Lane. And Christopher, gosh, how old is he now? I'm sure they're, they have great memories of, well, Lane has, of his wife. And hopefully the family's doing okay. So rest in peace, Marilyn. Rest in peace.